So, all right, so let's get in because because this, this will be a quick quick half hour, um, and I want to make sure we kind of be, be cognizant of your time um, and make sure we kind of cover the, all of our bases as well. So if you haven't already, um, open up a browser on your computer and uh, go to Brightspace, um, which is learn.zula.edu. <coughs> We're all on there? Okay. You can go ahead and log in if you haven't already. Are you <laughs> and I'm going to be working, just kind of showing you a few things in what's called my sandbox course, which is kind of a, a play, a place I can kind of experiment and play with things. Um, if you've got one of those, you can kind of follow along through that. You can do some of this stuff in a regular course as well and just not save it, or you can leave things marked as kind of hidden from students. So that if, you're, if you want to just kind of practice setting something up, but not have it get in the way of what your students see, you can do that as well. Or you can just kind of watch as we go um, through this as well. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to start with the assignments. I'm going to kind of work through that and then we'll come back and take a look and see how discussions are have some similarities to them and also have some differences to them as well. Um, the main thing to think about with what Brightspace calls the assignments tool is it's a place for your students to submit work that they've done, whether it's a word processing file, a PDF file, um, image files, um, short video files, audio files. They can upload all sorts of different files to you to take a look at. Right, and that's what we use the assignments tool for students to submit work to you in what's called a submission folder. So we're going to go through the process of creating a submission folder for an assignment to see what that looks like. <clears throat> um, to do that in Brightspace, we're always going to have this banner, this uh, menu across the top, right? And we're going to come to the activities page um, tab and click on that first option, which is assignments. All right, and on that assignments page, you're gonna see listed any of the assignment submission folders you've created already, right? Um, and if it's a new class or something you haven't uh, created any assignments in, it's gonna be uh, fairly empty, right, um, as well. <clears throat> in order to create a new assignment, we're gonna use this big blue new assignment button. Um, if you're not too familiar with Brightspace, the important buttons are always big blue buttons, right? We're gonna click on that, that new assignment button. And we're going to come to a page that says new assignment and gives us a bunch of different options. Right? Um, and Brightspace is pretty consistent with a lot of things. So setting up an assignment is going to look a lot like setting up a discussion board, which is going to look a lot like some other things as well. You're usually going to have several tabs to kind of uh, shift through um, when you're setting something up. And you're always going to start with what they call the properties tab, which is just kind of the general information. Um, for whatever it is you're setting up. When you're setting up an assignment, the one thing you must include is a name for the assignment. So if you're doing this kind of following along, go ahead and give it a name. Um, I'd encourage you to kind of name this something that, that clearly matches with, with whatever in your syllabus, something for the students, because the students are going to see this name as well. So don't just kind of do kind of a weird kind of shorthand that you understand. Make sure it's something the students will understand when they see it as well. Um, I'm going to call this reflection. You can name it whatever you want because you, you can delete it later as well. No, that's, that's fine too, right? But I, as you're setting this up for um, your classes, for your actual students, I'd suggest that you name things something that, that's going to make sense to them, right? To make it easy for them to kind of identify it because um, it's easy for students to click the wrong link and submit things in the wrong place as well. All right. So after the name, you have a big box here. Um, it, for the assignments, they call this the instructions box. And so this is where you'd want to come and tell the students what it is they're actually going to do for you or submit for you. You can type in some instructions here. Um, you can also, underneath it, add an attachment. So if you've got already kind of pre-existing assignment sheets for these things, you don't have to retype them um, or copy and paste them and worry about the formatting. You can just attach the assignment sheet to this and have all those instructions there as well. Right? 
So I usually just put something pretty kind of quick in the instructions folder. Hey, this is due on such and such a date, or this is what you're submitting by such and such a time. And then please see the attached assignment sheet for all the details. Um, but there's different ways you can do that as well. All right. If you scroll down below that, you're going to start to see some options. And a lot of what we'll do today is just look at some of the different options you are faced with when creating assignments um, and discussions in Brightspace. Right? Um, the first thing you're going to see is it's going to ask you, is this an individual assignment or a group assignment? Right? And if you have an option there, you can see this one's grayed out right now. Um, you're going to leave it as an individual assignment, which means every student in class is going to be submitting their own uh, work for this. Now you do have the option in Brightspace to create groups and then you could set it up so that each group, whether it's two students or four students or whatever, only has to submit one document for their assignments, right? But that's getting into a little more complexity with Brightspace. So we're gonna kind of move on beyond that for now and tell you if you're interested in groups, um, get in touch with, with uh, Janice or Elizabeth or I and we can, we can kind of talk you through that. Um, as well. So leave it as an individual assignment so each student has, uh, has that expectation. The next submit setting is submission type. Right? File submission means they're going to be uploading uh, a, a computer file to you, right? And, and there's a whole range of options there. The most common one is usually going to be some kind of word processing document, but it could be a spreadsheet, it could be images, um, it could be PDFs. Um, like I said, it could be even kind of short video files or audio files. You'd want to be careful with the size of those as well. It's, but it's something that they're actually uploading to you the same way they'd attach something to an email to you um, as well. So that's going to be the most common. There are a couple of other options, uh, some which aren't going to be so applicable to us. You could just have a text submission. So you could just kind of give them a text box to write something in if this were kind of a small quick kind of reflexive assignment. You just wanted them to type something and not even worry about uploading something. Um, and then the other two are really not going to be applicable for us as we're, as we're moving to this idea of remote teaching, which is if they turn something in in class, you can still give them a grade for it, even though they haven't physically submitted something through Brightspace. If you're having them submit a file, um, you can say you, they can upload multiple files or they can only upload one file. Um, <clears throat> You just want to be careful with this because every time I do a paper, I have at least one student who uploads the paper and then a separate file for their works cited page, uh, which always drives me crazy, but they still do it. And if you set it to one file, um, it's possible that it'll overwrite the previous submission and then all you end up with is a works cited page. So just kind of, you know, the default is to leave it as unlimited and to accept all submissions. That's usually kind of the safest bet is to just, at least for the start, leave things at their default. <clears throat> All right, notification email, just kind of skip over that. That's if you want somebody else other than the student to get a notification that they've turned in an assignment, right? Don't put your email in there or you're going to get an email about every single student submitting their assignment and, and you don't want that, right? <clears throat> Categories are just a way in this case, when you're creating an assignment, to kind of organize that submit that, that assignments page, right? If you have a lot of assignments that you're going to create, you can categorize them so that it's just a little easier to find things. Um, but again, for, for getting started quickly, I would just go ahead and kind of ignore the categories. It doesn't show up anywhere else. It's just a way to help organize your kind of assignments page. What is important is to think about evaluation and feedback. Again, we're not going to get into the grade book today, right? Um, but if you're having them turn in work, you want to tell them how much the assignment's worth, right? How many points is it going to be worth? And if you do have your grade book set up, you can link your assignment back to a specific column within your grade book, right? <clears throat> But you don't have to do that for the time being. Like I said, setting up the grade books is a little more complicated. So this is going to be worth 10 points. And you'll see it comes down here. It says, so this is what the students are going to see when they get their grade, 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 or whatever um, as well. <clears throat> if you use rubrics in Brightspace, which is an option, you can attach them to your assignments, and that makes grading it. Um, a little more consistent and a little easier because you can just kind of pick and choose which parts of the rubric that they get for each column. Um, but again, you don't have to use rubrics for this. 
these final items, I would just kind of leave them as they are. Don't worry about the e-portfolio thing. That's not really going to affect anything. Um, one option you have with the assignment submission folder is when students upload a document, whether it's a Word file, a PDF, an image file, or anything like that, you can go in and actually annotate it. And so you can mark on it. You can write in the columns or in the margins or on the, on the screen, on, the, on that digital document, um, to give them kind of the same kind of marginal feedback you might if you'd actually kind of gotten it by paper, right? Um, so all you need to do is make sure this is checked, which it is by default, right? Um, <clears throat> and then another option is you can say, I want to grade things anonymously. I don't want to know which students I'm grading, right? And again, if you want to do that, that's great. Um, I usually have students put their, you know, students tend to put their names on any documents they submit to me, so that doesn't really, that's not going to get hidden, right? But if you click that option, it, Brightspace itself won't tell you whose paper you're grading, right? So if you want to, if you want to try to grade anonymously, you can. You would just need to turn on that option, right? Okay, so that is the properties of the assignment. I'm going to click save to move on to the next tab, right, which is restrictions. And this is where you basically tell Brightspace when can students access this assignment, when can they submit the assignment, when is it due, and when can they stop, when can they not submit it anymore, right? So, uh, yeah, it depends on how you want to set it up. Due date is, is literally the due date, right? But due date in Brightspace does not prevent students from submitting after the due date. But Brightspace will mark it and it'll tell you, hey, this was submitted less than an hour after the due date, or this was submitted 42 days after the due date, right? So it'll, it'll tell you in bright red letters, you know, how late an assignment was, right? But the due date itself will not prevent students from submitting something late. And the end date will. End date will kind of cut students off from submitting anything else after whatever time you want to give them. So if you want to give them, you know, an, an hour's extra time, or you want to give them a, a, a day window, or you want to give them no window at all, you can do that with the end date. Right. You can leave the end date blank, you can leave the start date blank, you can leave the due date blank, um, but I'd really encourage you to think about at least using the due date because it really helps students. Brightspace has a nice notification system so that they're constantly being reminded of what's coming up and what's due in the next seven days and the next two days. Right? So they'll get, if they've got their notifications set up, they can get a little text message that says, hey, you've got a, uh, an assignment due in two days. Right? Um, so a lot of students have seen a lot of benefit from the notification system in Brightspace, but it only works if we give, it a due, if we give things due dates. Okay. <clears throat> this button up at the top, this is on by default. These other things down at the bottom, these are getting real advanced, so I'm going to skip past these. These are kind of where you can kind of control which students have access to an assignment, or you can give them kind of late due dates and things like that, but that's getting pretty advanced. So we're going to skip past that. Um, and I'm going to switch over to this final tab. Objectives, you'll often see an objective tab in Brightspace. Um, we're not using that function. ITC has not turned that on, right? So you just got to kind of ignore that tab. <clears throat> Turnitin is an option for assignments that are written. So if you're having students do any kind of writing, you can have those assignments processed through the Turnitin originality checker, right? Um, you need to turn it on by going to the Turnitin tab, and you need to do a couple of things under that tab. You need to select Enable Grade Mark, and it takes it a second to process it. And then you need to select Enable Originality Checker for this folder. Okay. And then you get a couple more options. Should students see their originality report? Right? So should they be told, hey, this paper has 20% match to some other things that, that Turnitin has found? Right? Um, or, do you, or do you want to be the only one who can see that? Right? I'm not going to get into the philosophy of which, is, which, is, which makes more sense, kind of. And then frequency. I would just, if you're doing turn it in, I would just leave it on automatic, right? So that everything, as soon as they turn it in, it's processed through turn it in. You can set it to manual. I'm not really sure why you, you know, do that, but they do give you that option. So when you're all done setting up your assignment, you click on again the big blue button, the save and close button, right? Um, and then your assignment is created down here, right? And then there's a couple of different icons you can kind of get used to. This I with a slash mark through it means it's hidden from students right now, right? 
And this little binoculars icon means turn it in as set on that. That's what those two mean. And then you can just kind of see, okay, so um, when you start getting assignments, you come to this page and it'll say, hey, you've received two papers, you've only graded one, right? Or you've only evaluated one, um, or you've published the feedback for so many. So this is, this is the page where you can kind of keep track of all that sort of stuff that, that you're, you're, how much you've graded, how much has been turned in and those sort of things. Okay. So that is very quickly how to set up an assignment submission folder in Brightspace. All right, let's switch over to discussions, right? Um, again, these are up in, they've got their own category up in that main menu, um, <clears throat> right next to the content link. The first thing you want to remember with discussions in, in Brightspace is a couple of different terms they use, right? They have forums and they have topics. The forums in Brightspace are really just, again, a, a way to kind of categorize things, right? Um, and so you can kind of cluster things together. The topics, the discussion topics in Brightspace are what the students would actually respond to and post about in Brightspace. So you might have weekly topics in response to their, their weekly reading assignments or something. So you might have, you know, week one topic, week two topic, week three topic, right? And then you could put them all together under one forum, right? Um, but you need to create at least one forum in Brightspace in order to have any given, have whatever topics you're gonna have. So you could just do one, one forum and have all your topics in there, or you could have, say, reading response, Top, you know, the reading response forum where you put all those discussions and, you know, class discussions forum where you have all those topics, right? So the, the forum is really just kind of a, an umbrella or category where the topics go. Um, whatever you're creating, again, on the discussions page, you click on the blue new button. I'm going to start by creating a new forum and you're going to see how few options you've got for this. Again, you need to give it a title. <clears throat> And you can, if you want, give it a description, right? Um, or you can just leave it blank. Um, you can do a few settings that, that span everything that's in the forum. You can say allow anonymous posts. So can students choose to anonymously post something or are, is their name always gonna be associated to it? Um, does a moderator, which would be yourself, need to approve every post before it becomes ex visible to all the other students, right? You probably not want to do that because there'd be a lot of kind of moderation on your part. Um, um, you can also kind of say, well, they can't look at something before they post something on their own, right, as well, which is this option right here. Users must start a thread, right? So in Brightspace, we've got the forum, which is kind of that umbrella category, the topic, which is kind of a question that they're responding to or a prompt or an assignment that they're responding to. And then within that topic, each, you know, they're, they're creating their own threads and they're saying, hey, this is what I think, and this is what I think. And then, um, so that's what we mean by threads right there. <coughs> and then do you want the description of the form to display, right? So you can just kind of, you know, kind of leave those as they are. Right? You can set, again, time and date restrictions on forums, right? So that they're only visible or, or accessible during certain uh, time periods, right? Or you can just kind of leave them as they are. But those are really the only settings you can do for a forum, right? <clears throat> it's the topics. So when you click on save there, you're gonna come back to that same page. You can do new again and click on new topic. <clears throat> and this is where it gets a little more detailed, right? But it's gonna look a little bit familiar with what we just looked at in the assignments page, right? So the properties. So what are the, the general properties of the form and, or the, of the topic. And you can see the first thing they do is you gotta, you gotta choose a forum, right? So that's, that's the thing, you have to have at least one forum to create topics in Brightspace. And you can see it's got the little asterisk there, which means you have to do it. So I'm gonna choose forum number two, which I just created. And then I'm gonna give this my very creative name of topic number two. Right? And then underneath that, you've got a description box, which is just like the instructions box for the assignments page, right? So this is where you would tell students, hey, this is what I want you to talk about in this topic. This is how many times I want you to post in this topic. This is how many times I want you to respond to somebody else's threads in this topic. Right? So again, this is where you would give them the actual assignments, the tasks that they need to complete for this, uh, this specific discussion. 
And again, you can see here, you've got kind of the same settings you had under the forum. So for each topic, you can, you can change the settings if you want to anonymous posts, moderator approved posts, and start a new thread before you can, uh, start a new thread before you can reply to somebody else's threads, right? You can also choose to do this kind of little social media thing. They like to build these into all these LMSs so students could come back and they can give a thumbs up um, or thumbs down to their, their colleague classmates posts or they can give them, you know, from one to five stars, right? Or you can, again, leave that off, right? Your call. <laughs> the ratings? It's a good question. I, I just usually ignore it. <laughs> um, but uh, I think they are. I think the students would just see that somebody gave them thumbs up or how many stars they saw. Um, yeah. They're always trying to keep up with social media. Okay, restrictions. This is going to look exactly like we saw in the assignments, right? So, except for one thing, because there's no due date for topics. Again, you can choose to hide it from users if you want to keep it hidden for a certain amount of time so there's no confusion. Right? Um, <clears throat> you can say, when can they start responding to this? When can they start posting to this board? So, that, that's the start date. And then, when's the last time or date they can? Uh, come back and respond to this as well. And then you can say, um, is this locked? So you can be visible, but still locked, right? Um, that's again, you know, just kind of how, how you want things to kind of come across. And it's something you can kind of play with a little bit as well. And then again, we get into kind of the, re the release conditions, which we're not gonna pay much attention to here today either because I want to show you one last thing with this, which is the assessment. Again, it's a little bit different with the, with, with, than we saw with uh, assignments, but also pretty similar as well. So you can attach any discussion topic you have back to a column in your grade book if you have that set up, right? So that when you grade it, that gets loaded into the grade book and calculated as part of their final grade, right? You can tell them how many points they're going to get or can possibly earn for their discussion as well. And you can, again, you can attach a rubric to this as well. If you've got a rubric that says, this is what I think a good discussion post looks like, or this is how many times you need to respond, or whatever like that, you can attach that rubric to the discussion uh, topic as well, and then grade them that way. You also have this option. This gets a little, little complicated because you can basically say if a student posts multiple times in a discussion thread, you can, you can grade each of those multiple instances, right? Um, I, I, I would not think that that would be preferable. That might get a little kind of complicated because you're doing it multiple times. If you turn that on though, then you can kind of say, so you know, average all those together for their grade or give them the highest score that they earned out of all those different topics or give them the lowest one or you can do those other kind of fancy mathematical things that I'm not going to try to describe. You have a question here? Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. You just want a level of participation they made a couple of comments and so on. That's great. <clears throat> so then just again, how many points is it possible to earn, right? And you can either set that up in a real simple rubric or you can just tell them ahead of time, hey, if you respond twice, you're going to get all 10 points, you know, and just do it that way. And that's usually what I do. That's kind of low stakes, um, you know, assessment of participation, right? If I see you're making a good effort and not just kind of ignoring the, 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 the assignment, you get the points. Great. Okay. Um, that works real well for discussions. Okay, and again, we get that objectives tab, which again, you just kind of ignore because we're not, we're not linked into that uh, right now with Brightspace. So, um, so you can see there's a lot of similarities between these two, right? Um, but a little bit of differences as well, right? And it's obviously kind of what you want to accomplish, right? Are they, are they turning something in that they've created? Right? Or are they kind of responding and interacting with each other through this discussion board? I'm sorry? And this, this topic was under the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and again, this works kind of like the assignments page, so you can just see all the discussions that are available, right? Um, and then you setting those start and end dates kind of helps a little bit with keeping students from kind of going into the wrong one, but also naming them real clearly, you know, week one or, you know, response to chapter six or whatever, you know, the more clear you are with the, with the naming, the easier it is for the students to go to the right place. Because it is possible in Brightspace to submit stuff in the wrong, in the wrong place. Yes, Would a tool like this be useful if you have recorded lectures that you want the students to view and then they can ask questions about what's been recorded mm -hmm. and then I can answer, but I don't want them emailing me the questions because yeah. I want everyone to be mm -hmm. able to see it. Right. Right. Yeah, That's and so you can set that up and not worry about any of the assessment stuff, right? So it can just be kind of a completely unassessed thing. But again, if, if, if they email you the question, they get the answer, but nobody else does. But if they post it to the discussion board, they get the answer and everybody else can see it as well. Yeah. And again, that, that's where the anonymous thing might be useful because if students maybe feel, you know, could feel a little more comfortable posting anonymously, right? Um, you know, there's other uses as well. So the anonymous thing only really works if you're not really worried too much about the grading. So yeah, it, it can work both as an assignment and also just as a means of communication, which documents and kind of catalogs that communication. Yeah. And again, that's what we've, we've done this a little bit with some of the policies that we've, we've discussed and voted on for, you know, academic assemblies and things like that as well, although they don't usually get a whole lot of traffic. Um, but it's a way to kind of put that, put that conversation up on the screen for everybody to see as well. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good use for it as well. So there's a very, very quick um, introduction to those two tools.